This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode, so please hit that subscribe button. And while your phone's out, please do me a favor and give us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It says, hey, this podcast has a great message, and we should send it out to more people. So please take that 30 seconds to a minute to do that review, and just maybe by doing that, it will push this up into someone's podcast feed that really needs this message. Hey, everyone. I want you to know how committed and dedicated I am to you. I truly appreciate and love those in the first responder world and those who surround them. They're an incredible, important part of my life. And I know if you're listening, they are yours as well. And that's why I have these guests on. I have these truly amazing guests on so you can learn from their struggles and maybe find those ways to improve your life. If you're struggling through life, and not being able to pick up on maybe some of these tips that these amazing guests are giving you, I offer a free 15-minute phone call with no obligations. I'm going to talk to you about you living up to your greatest potential and ways I can uplift you and assist you in your self-discovery and having you create true connections to people around you so you don't feel alone in this world that is so big and sometimes we feel so alone with what we're going through and our emotions. My job is to get you to your greatest potential and find ways to motivate you to do that. So please feel free to jump on a 15 minute phone call with me. You can find information at the website in during the badge podcast. And there's a little icon on the bottom right where you can leave me a voicemail or you can go to the coaching tab and schedule a call there. Or please feel free to reach out to me with a message on Instagram at Jerry Fire and Fuel. That's my personal one or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. My very special guest today is Frank Vos. And man, you've got to listen to this guy's story of resilience and vulnerability. I have not interviewed a guest that has been so vulnerable about their past as I have with Frank. He's an incredible human with an incredible story. We're going to talk about sobriety, mental health, being in and out of the hospital, rehab, acceptance, what wellness looks like, and peer support, and how fitness plays a role into that. Frank is the founder of Reps for Responders, and that's an incredible organization in itself that we're going to dive down into and explain what that is and how you can help them out. Now let's jump right into this episode with my very special guest, Frank Vos. How you doing, Frank? I'm doing good, Jerry. I uh, I appreciate uh, you having me on and <clears throat> having able to represent Red for Responders and uh, the great conversation uh, before we started. So thank you for what you do and uh, giving back to the community. Oh yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a it's a pleasure, right? When you able to serve both in your job and serve outside of your job, um, such as yourself. Frank, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. So my name is Frank Vos. Uh, I've been an active law enforcement officer for seven and a half years. Currently, I work in the New York City Police Department. I am not here representing the NYPD. I'm here representing Reps for Responders uh, and the founder of Reps for Responders nonprofit, which was founded uh, back in January of 2020. Yeah, so we were talking before we jumped on the show that you were able to get your uh, 5013C, your nonprofit started, and then you were able to open up a gym and then COVID hit. Yeah. So I went through a really, really tough and dark time back in 2018. Um, I actually was NYPD then for two and a half years. And I actually left the department to go to my hometown department. Um, And when I went there, that's kind of where the upside down. I don't know if you watch Stranger Things or anything, or that's where I kind of <laughs> kind of ended up in the upside down and um had to face like uh base not like I had to face one of the scariest uh moments of my life and people in my life. And ultimately, Jerry, that was myself. You know, I had to kill that version of myself 
um, which was not, not easy. And then ended up going through what I went through, major depressive disorder, alcohol use disorder. Uh, went back, actually went back to the NYPD. Because if you leave, you have up to a year to come back. So I made it up back in that 10 months. Uh, but by that time, I was like walking dead, like a zombie. I felt soulless. Um, it was very, very dark. And then um, when I went through my recovery and and started that process in 2019, NYPD had 10 officers lose their lives to suicide. Um, and I said, wow, you know, I could have been number 11. It was pretty close. And the job then had some resources, but not what it is today. So I started doing a lot of self research of like twenty percent of first uh, twenty percent of everyday people suffer from trauma, anxiety, and depression. That increases to thirty percent for first responders. One in five officers have a suicidal ideation in their lifetime. So not a plan, but a thought of I hope if I go into work today, I get into a shooting, or if I'm driving my car, I wrap it around a pole or a tree. The average age of a cop is fifty-seven to sixty-five. Fifty percent of law enforcement officers, when they retire within the first five years, have a major cardiovascular issue so it could be type 2 diabetes high blood pressure heart attack and said wow something really needs to be done and i didn't know much about business but i know that working out eating as healthy eating as good as i could can and talking about my day with like-minded individuals good day or or bad day i don't even know if we really count bad days right um hour by hour um has really helped me so just went, took that addiction, flipped the perspective and the switch and said, how can I help? And started thinking and started a nonprofit. Someone said it would be a good idea. So I just did it and uh, got approved the 501c3 here in New York. And then March of 2020 is when we really started to promote it and open up a gym free for first responders and military uh, in March of 2020. And the idea was to have first responders go and work out, right? So now if I'm a cop in the city, I might not feel comfortable talking about what I'm going through with or a cop in the Bronx or Manhattan. But if I meet another cop in maybe Queens or or another county nearby or a fireman or a volunteer fireman, now it's like, oh, you know, you're you're here to work out. You want to better yourself. Tell me a little, you know, start talking. Oh, OK, wow. Like now maybe coffee before or after and get that number. And that was like the the illusion because every every uh, once a week we want to have like a roll call of whatever happens here stays here unfiltered roll call and try to just let guys and girls vent where it's a safe haven and uh, have in-person meetings. But uh, unfortunately that did not last because the gym was open for 10 days for good. And then, and then COVID happened. Yeah, that's crazy. How, how did you survive the, the COVID shutdown? <clears throat> well, we first, we, re- we started a GoFundMe like, I feel like a lot of people do. And and it actually started to like blow up. Like people started to donate a lot, like a lot of money because I would say the flavor of of the year that year for NYPD was the unfortunately the officers losing their life to suicide. And it and it still should be talked about every single single day, you know. Um and we raised money quick, was able to donate that money into the equipment and then the rent. And I put a lot of my own money into it. Um and then at that crossroad where if I go left, I can say, well, I was about four months sober at the time. Well, you know, it was worth a shot and I can focus maybe on my own sobriety and just say, Hey, you know, it was, we gave it a shot and it didn't work out and that's it. Yeah. Or the other path was, this is when first responders really need us the most. Uh, this is when Frank needs himself the most and let's just not give up on it right now. Uh, just because, it didn't go your way, right? In AA terms, it goes our plan versus our higher powers plan. So kind of made a tactical retreat, surrendered to the COVID and made a strategic plan for now. Jocko Willing talks about tactical planning versus strategic planning. And uh, we just did a lot of online like everyone else did and uh, had a good team behind me and still do to this day. Can't Couldn't do this alone, not at all. And we just uh, started doing online workouts and just posting mental health um, basically like statistics and the science behind it. And just like having an active cop, especially in the NYPD, myself and other first responders up on board, but talk about their issues and talk about this was like, oh, some people were kind of like, you know, holy, holy crap. Uh, this this guy is talking about this and he's going through what he like just went through and still being monitored by the job. 
And I said, what are they going to do? Send me, send me back to re send me back to rehab. That's fine. I'll, 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 I I make a joke and say, I would love to go once a year. You know, you go there, you get paid, you get to work on yourself and things like that. Um, and a big, a big part of our program today, but started back in, I would say April, 2020 was our responder talk meetings. And that's every Sunday night via zoom seven to 8 PM Eastern time. And that's open to all active and retired first responders. And our umbrella is police, firefighter, EMS, EMT, correction, nurses, uh, police dispatchers, uh, or any any dispatcher really, and military personnel. So we've had check-ins from 23 different states across the country, which has been a blessing. Because now if I'm a cop in New York, going back to what I said, and I hear something in the meeting from a cop in Utah or a firefighter yeah. in Utah or California, I'm like, wow. Now I really like, there's no way this is ever going to get back to my job. I might not even feel, ever meet this person. I might feel comfortable opening up to this person. And we have a lot of, you know, people checking in from New York to New Jersey, to Florida, Colorado, Texas, Delaware, Maryland, um, you name it, uh, Massachusetts. Those are just like the the main names that are coming in my head, the people that are yeah. in these states <laughs> that come all the time. Um, and that kind of just... That's like our bread and butter of our program from topic meetings to guest speakers. We've had guest speakers, Navy SEALs, NFL players, big fitness um, names, uh, doctors, your everyday cop, your everyday fireman, just talking about their story or bringing up a topic and, you know, how did they get to where they they are today and, and share their strengths, experience and hope. Yeah. Yes, that's quite a, a journey. So I'm going to kind of dive down into some of this with you, Frank. And I'm like, you know, with two years on the job, you, you felt like you're kind of like two to three years, you're like a walking zombie. How did, how'd you get to that point? Like that's in some people's mind. I know you like, that seems very quick, but I mean, everybody carries their own, their own weight and, you know, and I can't walk in your shoes. So I have no, no idea. Right. We can't judge others for, you know, how fast things happen to them or don't happen to them. Uh, yeah. So that's a great question. Actually, I, I'm, I have probably done like 10 to 15 of these and I don't think anyone ever worded it like that. So I appreciate that and, and uh, would be more than glad to to share it with you and your audience. So I left in 2018 and when I was there in, uh, in the Bronx, a cop in the Bronx by Yankee stadium, very busy command, a busy house. I was able to, I would say, I don't want to say leave everything because that, that would be just be me lying, but leave most things in, in the city mm -hmm. uh, and able to have a very, very strong camaraderie. So I played college football um, upstate in New York. And when I got into the city, it kind of felt like, oh, wow, you know, the camaraderie, the back on that football field, that's a young mindset. I was 23 at the time, right? So a 23 year old. Um, and I, I believe that even 21 is still young, it's way too young to, to be a cop. And what life experience do you, do you have? I'm 30 years old now, and I have some life experience and a lot more, but you really have to know who you are and, uh, really stop lying to yourself. But anyway, um, that's what I was doing. I was lying to myself a lot. And I thought, you know, I was competing in powerlifting and doing all these shows and, I uh, couldn't miss like hanging out with the guys and, and uh, the four to fours where you work a four to 12 and then you go out and you go to the bar and you hang out with the guys and girls, mostly guys. And then uh, what do you do? You talk about the job, you talk about police work. So if you think about it, you just worked another four hours for free because <laughs> your brain didn't shut off about police work, right? True. <laughs> true. Uh, and you probably spent more money. You didn't work for free because you're spending money at the bar. So when I left, I came to my hometown department. It was like the, I call it the Willy Wonka golden ticket. Like I got it closer to home, safer, more money. It's, it's like a no, it's a no brainer. Right. And for me, I would say the, in the beginning had a little rough FTO um, experience and things like that, that really bothered me. And, and I was, it's not double man car or partner. It's a solo patrol. So as time went on, I was doing solo patrol in my hometown and I just felt like I couldn't escape. And I just started playing that what if factor and that tape and creating scenarios in my head over and over again. Do I want to do this for 20 years in my hometown? Uh, felt like I couldn't, I couldn't escape. There were, you know, you know, a lot of people there and 
you know, you're going to calls where you grew up with some people and there are situations where you got to do what you got to do. Gave my own uncle Narcan and CPR. I mean, compete, like being at an incident where you, you know the person and things like that. And kind of just like, did I make this decision for myself or did I make this decision for my ego? And at that point, probably my super ego to say, well, look at me. I got out of the, I got out of NYPD and all you suckers are still there and I'm young and I made, I'm going to make all this money. I'm in this really, really great department. And, um, I did it and I started to beat myself up a lot. And the way I knew how to cope then was either work out or hang out with Jack and Jose, Jack Daniels and Jose Cuervo. So I went from, uh, drinking on my off days and I was a blackout drinker. I was, Jerry, if we're going to the bar, you know, we're not going to go for one. I got to have at least 10 beers before we uh, get there. And then I got to pay for your drinks. And, you know, life is great. And Jerry, I love you, man. And, you know, I, I don't even know who you are. We've been talking for three, three, you know, yeah, for like 15 minutes, right? Yeah. That's the kind of person I was. And when I went, started to that negative thinking wheel, uh, started to see behaviors in myself and it happened relatively quickly for me um drinking alone never drank by myself ever um started to shy away from things that i enjoyed which was working out talking to my friends get rid of my social media um want to get out of bed so those are signs of what depression right and yeah. I, I didn't know at the time and as i started seeing this and my girlfriend was very worried and uh, we moved into an apartment together and um, I thought that would fix everything. You know, it'll make her happy. We'll move in and it'll be good. And this will just kind of disappear. Um, but it didn't disappear. Uh, my drinking started to increase. And I remember when I had uh, my very, like very vividly remember basically my first panic attack. And I don't like that word. Um, basically, it's it's in us. It's been in yeah. us since the start of mankind, right? Fight flight or freeze yeah um parasympathetic nervous system and just going off the adrenaline the cortisol right and that's when i was like wow okay and got really i just remember being very anxious like a little rabbit all the time and started to take over and the drinking just when you're going through a mental health crisis or just any type of mental health issues um that drinking to me and my experience will speed that up very, very quickly. Because in the moment, yeah. you think it's just numbing and hiding everything, right? But then the effect of two to three days later, it's like 10 times worse. So now if it's 10 times worse, what am I going to continue to do? Well, I'll just drink to numb it out. Yeah. So that's kind of where that question, hopefully I answered it, was my drinking and my behaviors definitely sped that process up. And I'm an addict. So um if I'm beating myself up and I, uh, I'm going to beat myself up even harder. And yes, you could definitely be addicted to your thoughts. And then I just remember one day waking up and everything was black and white, not literally, but my perception. And I, I just like remember feeling my nervous system just shut off and said, Frank, sorry, we can't take this anymore. We're done. We're leaving you. And I couldn't feel anything. I mean, if we were walking down the street and we waved at my mom and someone was robbing her, I remember just saying it back then, five years ago, I would just watch like I couldn't decide what i wanted to do to eat i just remember in the in the car having a green um a green tea from dunkin donuts and i would get a protein shake and that's all i would eat so now i was really stuck like now i was depriving my physical body as well yeah. and then i thought like in my mind well i made this choice i came here and um now i have to suffer uh, i have yeah. to suffer i have this is part of being a cop this is part of being a first responder is that you know this is I have to suffer and I have to do this. Yeah. So when you, when you woke up and everything was kind of black and white, we just like, just totally, like you're saying, just totally numb. Like, how did you know when or how to, to get help if you're like feeling just n nothing, I guess. Yeah. That's when I said, wow, I was 25 at the time then. And I said, all right, this is what depression is like depression is real so before that it's like how can anyone ever be depressed life is good come on it can't last longer than because everybody gets anxious or depressed um sure. and you get anxious for on a job a new promotion going on a date new school whatever it is 
But then that was my mindset then. And, and still it is today that everyone goes through. It's being human spouts yeah. of anxiety and depression. And then when I realized it was lasting for months, I was like, oh, okay. And I think consciously I was trying to hide it. And then I have a great family and support network. And I was kind of like a broken record, you know, should I stay or should I go? That song, should I stay or should I go? And yeah. right. That was my life. I couldn't talk about anything else. Um, and I was getting tired of being sick and tired and seeing myself slowly crumble. So I went and saw a uh, psychologist, um, social worker. And I just remember even paying like cash because I was so worried that the job is going to find out. And it wanted to go on his insurance. It couldn't go on insurance. I'll pay out of pocket, all this. And I uh, did that. And after a few months, recommended a psychiatrist. And uh, still at that department, right? Where, and uh, I just remember getting put on my first medication ever was Seroquel and Prozac. And when was within like two weeks, uh, that's when the suicidal ideation started to occur. And I said, well, I'm literally going to like going to work, going into the RMP, the police car. And I, I can't even remember the password to log in. Like I'm putting in old passwords and I'm beating myself up more. I'm sweating, right? These are very powerful medications. Yeah. So I said, why would I take this medication if I feel like this when I can just drink? So I stopped the cold turkey, yeah. which you definitely should not do. And I started drinking again. It was back and forth. And in that in that span, Jerry, within a span of a year, I was put on seven different SSRIs, antidepressants, serotonin. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and for the listeners, if you, you don't know what the SSRIs are, right? It's serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So it's basically take this pill, and not, over ninety five percent of our serotonin is created in our stomach, right? So it doesn't actually create serotonin but what it does the brain receptors it tries to heal those brain receptors from the inflammation the over the trauma the overthinking whatever's going on up there right the, the brain is still being studied today and it's magnificent yeah. it's very magnificent <laughs> yeah it is and try to heal those so your but then you will release more serotonin and that's why we also push a lot of fitness and nutrition here at rep for responders because we firmly believe and science will show the foods we eat can either help fight against our depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. or will help cause our anxiety and depression. So just going back and forth and still not accepting that drinking is, is an issue. Here are five tips if you're feeling stuck in your life still. One, take full responsibility of your life. Don't be that victim anymore. You have to get past that. Number two, praise and enjoy the process. Focus on the journey when things get tough. Focus on the end, where you're headed and why you're headed there. If you truly know, those little things are not going to knock you off your track. Number three, become anti-fragile. Once again, don't let those little things knock you down. Learn a breathing process so you can get through them and not get stuck in that moment. Number four, cut out the crappy friends that are sucking the life out of you because you can't excel if you're around a bunch of crappy friends that are not going to help you excel. And number five, you need to cultivate grit and perseverance. Knowing your journey and having it written down and having a destination is going to keep you on track and help you with that grit and perseverance on getting you to where you want to be. Now let's jump right back into this episode. You know, um, I remember the psychiatrist wasn't very fond of her, but I didn't know better. Uh, mentioned AA meeting and I was like in my head, I'm like, all right, I'll check it out in my head. I'm like, there's no way. Like I'm, I'm not one of them. I'm not, no way. And, uh, yeah, as time went on, it got worse and worse. And, uh, probably in about October of 2018, uh, my girlfriend left and then I was like, oh, wow. You know, I was in this apartment for what, five, six months. It was a disaster. I wasn't getting, it wasn't doing anything. Wasn't paying for cable. Wasn't taking care of the house. I was just drinking and hiding and lying and very happy that she left because she was suffering a lot too. And, and yeah. You know, there's just, we have to remember that being a first responder and also the disease of, of addiction is a family, a family disease. It affects everybody. So then I moved back to my parents' house and, uh, 
let's just say that it was still very, very dark. My friends really, they felt bad, but they couldn't do anything. And they didn't really want to talk to me anymore because I would just have the same conversation over and over again. And here I am just seeing myself literally just crumple. And basically the thought of what do I have else to to live for? I was able, I kept my goals of working out, college football. I became a cop in the city, in my hometown. There's nothing else for me. There's nothing else here. Um, and for so long, I didn't want to reach out because how can I? There's no way I'm going to let my gun and shield get taken away. Right. Or, not or, but I'd basically rather just kill myself if we're being flat out honest. That was the thinking. That's how, like, that's what was happening. I can understand that. I can understand that. And we see it a lot in in this field, yeah. right? So my aunt is a doctor at a big hospital in New York City. And she's like, you know, you're you're in a very bad way. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, you should go to New York Presbyterian in Manhattan um, and kind of fought that. And then November of uh, 2018, I made that decision and kind of family made that decision for me. And I just said, okay, like I'll go. And uh, I went there and talked to the doctors. And they said, um, you know, you, you, we, I try to explain what was going on as best I can in that mindset. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and already talking about it so much. It's like how much more, it, every time you speak about it, it's just like, it burns a little more. Um, and that's really all I kind of like taught myself to just keep speaking about that. And, um, but I wasn't doing any like action, right? Like, yeah, I was going to therapy and ultimately that therapist really opened up my mind and, and, and was a huge part of my recovery and saving my life. Uh, but by then I was, I didn't see that back then. <sighs> and then they said, okay, sign this paper and we'll take care of you. And, and I said, okay, so I signed this paper and I got uh, admitted and then they took me upstairs and I remember seeing like, I was in like this glass big room and it was like a, oh, this is like five star for uh, <laughs> a hospital. And I ended up going to sleep that night and I woke up and they're like, all right, we're going to move you over to our center in Westchester. And I said, okay, no problem. And what left the hospital about to go on the ambulance. They're like, uh, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean? Like you have to, you have to go on the stretcher. And I'm like, what? I'm like, are you serious? So I go on a stretcher and now I'm like, all right, things are kind of off and pull up to this place, walk inside. And I'm like, all right, take your shoes off, uh, untie your, take your shoelace off. And that's when I knew like, holy shit, like you're in the psych ward. And now I said to myself, now I'm really done. Like I'll never be a cop again. No one will trust me. This is this is bad in my head, you know, I was like, maybe I'll sure. be like a lobster fisherman in Maine and just leave. And just a lot of guilt and shame and didn't want to be seen by anybody. Cause it's like how life was going great. Right. Like and I was speaking about this before Frank plan for a higher power plan in <laughs> yeah. AA terms and kind of self-sabotage my own self. And uh, I really couldn't take that then. So I was in there for about two weeks and it, what it did was it basically kept me safe from because I couldn't leave because of I was very honest at that point. I was just, very, you know, I was being very vulnerable without even knowing I was being vulnerable. And I, I would say I was pretty, pretty honest, but of course, it took some time to get some things out. And it was 23 hours and 50 minutes a day in a legit psych ward. Uh, there are stories in there for another time. Um <laughs> And some and some really, really spiritual awakening stories too, like some spiritual moments of coming across people that I've came across on the job of policing. Right. Yeah. Um and you talk to the doctor for 10 minutes and then that was it. So then you have 23 hours and 15 minutes to do these groups, medication time, meal time, use the phone when when you're allowed to uh go outside twice twice a week for 30 minutes a day. Like it was a prison. There was no rehab in there at all. It was really just to, to keep you safe. And I, I'm talking really sick people with like psychosis and schizophren uh, schizophrenia in there. Yeah. So I left and I literally remember leaving, like laughing out loud, like the Joker. And I said, holy shit, like I'm worse. Nothing changed. And as cops and first responders, we want, we think we're in control of everything. Like we want 
to control it. We want this decision done now and we want to fix it and just like leave. But there is no fixing this in a day, in five hours, in a yeah. week, in a month. It takes years. So I, what did I do? And I got put on another medication there. It was a fixer. So from, I've been about right, like what, maybe like 10 months now, 11 months I was put on. And I'm only saying this so people can, you know, there might be listeners that have been on it and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and again, just please do not, do not drink on it. If you're going to take medication, uh, medication is, a, it does help, but you also have to put in the work of the therapy of eating correctly, of any type of fitness, right. of any type of resiliency skills, coping skills that you have. It's not just popping a pill and all right, my depression is going to go away. Ultimately, you need to be honest with yourself. You need to surrender. And there's a difference between surrendering and quitting. I was on the Prozac, the Seroquel. Then I was on they off of that. Then I was on Zoloft. Then I was on Wellbutrin. Then I was on Rexulti. Then when I went into Presbyterian, I was put on a Fexer. And the movie The Departed, did you ever see that with Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg? Uh the the police movie, it was I don't know, maybe early like two thousands. Anyway. I'm sure I have. It's just like yeah. not ringing a bell at this. Mark Wahlberg this is, is a, uh no, Leonardo DiCaprio is basically wants to be like a trooper and a, and a cop in, in Massachusetts. And they have him do this undercover work first before he can really get where he wants. And he's pretending to be somebody like basically in the mob that he's not, and it's destroying him. So I remember him seeing a therapist oh, yeah. and she's like, how are you feeling? And he's like, you want to know how I'm feeling? I'm being somebody that I'm not, I'm taking these medicaid I'm taking these pills that's driving me crazy, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a scene that he's with like right after, like during the scene, actually flips to another scene. He's with, um, Mark Wahlberg and Mark Wahlberg basically like calls him out and says, everybody basically goes through this, like you're a cop man up. I can have your file erased in a second. Like, this is what happens. Like just basically shut up, stop talking about it and just do your work. And that's how I felt in the, in, yeah. in that time. And it was just like a perfect relation to, to my life then. So when I left and I, what did I do? I checked myself back in. And I said, I got to tell you guys something. And I said, uh, I've been drinking. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you tell us that in the first place? And I said, because I didn't know it was a big deal. <laughs> and they just looked at me and they handed me this book. And uh, I said, okay. They said, I want you to read the, this thing called The Doctor's Opinion. And I said, okay, this is a pretty long, big book. What's it called? They said, it's the big book. I said, I know it's a big book. <laughs> they said, it's the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, oh, okay. <clears throat> So I read that. It took me a long time to read the doctor's opinion there, but I read it uh, and just trying to concentrate on the page and have it make sense. And I just remember what stuck with me then was people that are suffering from alcohol use disorder, uh, alcoholism, whatever you want, whatever you call it. Um, it's an allergic reaction to the brain. And I kind of just saying to myself, well, if I was going to eat, I don't know, peanuts or peanut butter or chocolate and my throat would close and all that. Like, why would I keep doing this? Obviously alcohol is, is very powerful. So I just, that's just, that just stuck with me. So they said, okay, what we'll do is we're going to hold you for another two weeks and then we'll put you in our inpatient treatment downstairs. So I said, okay. So I did that, went to the inpatient treatment, um, basic knowledge, uh, and it was okay, but I was there for like a total of six weeks. So I got out and at that time, my PVA rep took, took my gun and shield away from me and everything. And then I had to go see the job psychologist. And when I went there, it was kind of, I remember vividly walking in and the psycho psych psychologist saying like, wow, like you, you're very depressed. And I just wanted to be like, no shit. Like, <laughs> thanks for pointing out the obvious. <laughs> so insult to injury that almost there. Yeah. It was just like, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. And um, I ended up asking, basically, I said, I want to, I said, I want to be a cop. I know I'm a good cop. I came back for this job for this reason. I just, I just need some help. Um, and she said, I said, any recommendations or what's going to happen? And there was no, like, you should reach out to this person or talk here. It was, well, New York Presbyterian said you have put an outpatient program. Why don't you just do that? And I just said, okay. So I did that. I was going to Jersey. And it was an outpatient program where it was just like a kind of like a kumbaya circle. Um, nice people, but it was just not helping me. Uh, and I wasn't helping myself. So going through that for like a month and I was, my mom just found 
and she's a nurse too. My dad's a volunteer firefighter for 40 years. My uncle is FDNY, had to retire because of 9 11. Both my great grandparents were NYPD. So it kind of, I guess, runs in the blood and the, and the yeah. DNA. Um, and it's kind of all I knew because in my mind, I said, well, my whole family also grew up in my hometown. <clears throat> and going through all that transition was like, how could I leave? I don't want to, I don't want to let other people down. That was still my, my, my mindset. And I was doing it for all these other people. Meanwhile, Jerry, I was literally, literally killing myself, like mentally, physically, spiritually, everything. Um, and she's found this rehab center for me. We call it the farm in please terms. And I was still, I was like, there's no way I'm going to go away somewhere when I just got out of this, you know, we'll leave it like that. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up doing it like two, three days later. I thought about it, you know, uh, was still drinking when I got out. Maybe that lasted like, I don't know, a few days. And I said, okay. And I went and I went to, they kind of basically forced me, which is good. I went to High Watch Recovery Center in Kent, Connecticut. I was there for two weeks, the zombie. I mean, like lifeless. And then for another four weeks, I kind of started to come back alive. And uh, it was a great place and started to really work on like the AA model. You got a psychologist, a uh, social worker in there, a psychiatrist. And I'm just like in there in a dorm with like 12 other guys and realizing that, yes, I'm a cop. There's no other cops there, but there's doctors, lawyers, blue collar people, homeless people all together for this disease of addiction. I'm like, wow, you know, we're really not, and I say we as in like cops first, we're really not so different than yeah. the rest. And the answer is that's true because we're all human. We have the yeah. central nervous system, um, same brain, same heart. It's just, what are we doing with the experiences in our childhood and things like that? That really is what, what makes us different. And of course our DNA, we don't want everyone walking around looking like me. That's just, that would be a disaster. <laughs> so I left there. And I went back and I still had my job, right? So think about it, Jerry. I They allowed me to go. I went there for six weeks and I came home. I had three checks waiting for me. So I literally got paid to work on like my recovery, sobriety and things like that. And maybe I was I was sober for a little bit and I got transferred from my, from my precinct to somewhere else. And at first I was like, oh, here we go again. You know, gonna have to share my story. No one's gonna want to talk to me and everything like that. This guy's nuts. This guy's crazy. Ended up being one of the best things that happened. Was working in the detective bureau, learned a lot of detective work, met a lot of good and cool people, experience, and it was actually phenomenal. So, um, as I'm going through that in my career, um, September of well, before September happened, I went to rehab. I went to rehab February of 2019 to April of 2019, and then the summer came around, and I kind of said, "All right, summertime, still have my job. I'll only drink at Yankee Game for the Jersey Shore, where will no, where where nobody will know who I am. Wow. No one will yeah. will know. And uh, of course, that didn't last very long. And then my my girlfriend came back into my life, and she heard and kind of basically heard through the grapevine that I was attempting to get sober and I was sober, blah, blah, blah. And we were going back and forth. And then finally I asked her if she wanted to come to a wedding with me in like September of 2019. And she actually said, yes, I'm like, okay. And we went and I told myself I wasn't going to drink. And I walked in there and there's a waterfall, water fountain, Ciroc vodka coming down. And I was like, all right, it's over. And I'm like, I'm not going to drink that much. I'm not going to say anything stupid. I'm going to be cool. Calm. Like, these are the thoughts I'm telling myself. Sure. I ended up blacking out and she drove my car home. And then uh, the next day, this is another thing called the spiritual awakening in AA terms. I, uh, we had a dog park and she was very upset. She's like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like I came back into your life. I want to leave already. Your friends are coming back to your life. You still have your job. Do you really want to kill yourself because of this? And there was still a lot of things I had to work on of letting go and saying like, it's okay. Like, it's okay that that job didn't work out and it's ultimately okay is because I, I, I wasn't ready. And I said, you're right. I'm going to hit a meeting tonight 
and September 23rd of 2019, that kind of just took off one meeting at a time, one day at a time. And then I kind of dove, that's why I flipped the switch and started really researching all of this first responder mental health um, criteria. And that's how Rep for Responders was basically, was basically born and going through the COVID and that. And now instead of having a gym, what we do is we raise, what we raise money for is we raise money for, we pay for first responders, their gym membership. So we have partnership over here in New York with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym, a CrossFit gym, a strength and conditioning gym, and we'll pay for your first 90 days. And of course, there's criteria you have to meet in month one, month two. And after those 90 days, it's up to you if you want to continue to be a member of that gym. Uh, we have, uh, I'm a recovery coach. So recovery coach through, through substance use disorder and substances. My wife is uh, a recovery coach. So yeah, that girlfriend became my wife. We just got <laughs> married in August. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you. So she's a, she's the vice president. She is a health coach. She's a recovery coach. She's a huge, huge help, huge part of reps for responders. Yeah. Huge help to reps and a huge help to, to helping me uh, in my recovery journey, <laughs> keeping me in line. Uh, she runs a, she started her own business and uh also she has a full-time job but she started this business called relationships and recovery so every wednesday night she runs a meeting for females only where their spouses or boyfriends or sons are attempting to get sober or they just started recovery and it's uh, across the country girls just checking in and it, it's it's been a great thing and of course like ha- being a leo wife it's it's great for when other people reach out and when i speak to them they're like oh can my wife and you know give that contact to christina um, we have the nutrition and health coach as well, where 90 days we pay for once a week, the check-ins and it's more of everyone thinks you're coming for the food, but it's like, let's, let's see what's happening first <laughs> with your habits, your behavior, how much nicotine, how much caffeine are you sleeping? Little things like that. Um, and attacking that, those meal, that those meal plans and those calories strategically instead of like, all right, just follow this and cookie cutter for basic. No, it's, it's not like that. Mental health professional addiction and trauma specialists uh been doing it for 40 years and what we do is we will pay for 12 resiliency sessions we call it and it's basically uh, information and education on learning how to stay present mindfulness education on addiction and and uh education on anxiety and depression so hopefully when that for and that first responder will have some tools now on their gun belt um on their fire truck, whatever on 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 their person, on their in their toolkit, and take it for their coworkers, but ultimately take it for themselves. Yeah. We do event, we do events um, in honor of the officers that lost their lives to suicide the previous year. So we do all workout events. We've done them across New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, um, Virginia. We wrote a book that's on Amazon, uh, building resiliency and conquering the job for responders basically how we started why we started the services we provide and basic information on mental health fitness nutrition emotional intelligence um kevin gilmartin who wrote the emotional survival guide for law enforcement a guide for officers and families uh full read of the book for us so just really really cool things um and of course running that meeting every sunday and uh here we are today today is january 16th 2023 none of us have ever lived this day before unless you're Marty McFly, right? So that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a grounding tip that <laughs> yeah. that we use here is to be easy on yourself. And we don't know what's going to happen in this day, but we got to be do the best that we can. And if we're doing that, the next right thing, that kind of leads us up to a lot less suffering because there's no escaping the suffering. It's just when it happens, where are you going to, where are you going to put it? Yeah. And you don't have to put it somewhere alone. It's true. It's true. Frank, man, that's, that's a, that's a powerful story. That is quite a journey. I like just sitting back here listening that that took a lot of, I don't know how to like classify it into words, like bravery, fortitude, like a lot of different things to get through that extended period of time. Like, what, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Like, and I also love like reps for first responders. I always think like we're pretty good in, you know, taking care of our body. Let's say working out wise, I won't say any other taking care of our body, but maybe we can, we like know how to work out, but the mental reps, right. It's the combining the physical and the mental, the reps, like 
doing one without the other is only going to get you so far, right? It's not going to get you all the way to where you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's connected. I mean, when you look at depression as well, you look at any type of mental health disorder, it also affects the physical body. And when you work out, of course, a lot of people want to work out for the changes in the physical appearance, but then it's also helping out your heart, it's helping out your organs, it's improving your brain, it's releasing the, the dopamine, the serotonin, the endorphins. It is fully connected. Um, and part of that journey as well that I left out was I actually left that department and in February of this year, I, uh, I got a call from the NYPD health and wellness section that was created because of the suicide, which we call epidemic in 2019. And they asked me if I wanted an interview because of the work I was doing at Red for Responders. So got the, did the interview, had that, got, had that gig. And I did that from February to this past December. And I was um, just basically doing what I was doing already, which was great, getting, getting working and helping cops with sobriety, recovery, working out, nutrition, resiliency, teaching at the academy, one police plaza, like things that if we if you were if you walked into my 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 psych ward wing and said, Frank, like hang on tight, like we're <laughs> gonna have this podcast in like three years and you're in four years, we're gonna be helping out a lot of men and women together, I would be like, Jerry, kid hit the road hit the road yeah. Jack. you know like come on um and, and that's a beautiful thing about recovery is that promises do come true and things happen and like more than our wildest dreams like really the answer was always right in front of us like the door was right there but it was just we were always just so clouded that we couldn't even like open up the door um and going through what i went through january of 2020 sorry to bring it back was supposed to be my final interview with the jobs psychologist i was telling you about mm-hmm so talking about being sober and able to like slow it down and and able to de- hopefully not hopefully deal with your emotions the best you can i got a phone call basically stating that my doctor left the department 2 hours i got a call 2 hours before my final interview and i had to start with a new doctor and i said what i had to say and then that sorry it's a, they said sorry it's a mistake up on the higher up end we'll call you in 2 weeks january 2020 that turned to 8 months Nobody on the job, call, text, email, reach out, nothing. So that kind of let more fire to really pushing reps quicker and starting that. Because I said, holy shit, like, how? How could, like, I was four months sober at the time. Like, what about all the other guys or girls, the cases that she had? They they just disappear like dust in the wind. So that was one of the main reasons why. So then I started in July of 2020, a new doctor. And no doctor is going to sign off on the other doctors. Um notes and all that i had to start the process all over again which benefited me even more because i was able to have steady days off able to have a routine and all that stuff and then i finally went back full duty so i was i was in purgatory i was a misfit jerry for four years and i finally went back full duty the day before thanksgiving this year and then since i was on restricted assignment, uh, I had to go back to my permanent, my temporary, my permanent command. So it happened quick because of the understaffing and the NYPD and everything that's going on. And they sent me back to my original precinct that I left and came back for. And now I've been back on the street for a, a, a month doing patrol, um, back in the city in the South Bronx by Yankee stadium. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different journey trying to get back in the health and wellness section because that's, I feel like my destiny is for that. And it's my passion. And and what I, what I really enjoy is being able to have a relationship with someone. And it's not like going to a call and, and of course you help people, but it's like, all right, you take a report or maybe you, you know, give CPR and you say, do what you got to do. And then it's just like, all right, like have a good life. Yeah. Right. Have yeah. a good life. Uh, and then, of course, you get the typical run-ins that you come into in the street and things like that. And that's it. But now with this type of work and even having this podcast, you're able to like really learn about the person and watch the person grow. And ultimately, they help you grow. Yeah. You always see a part of yourself in somebody. That's Agreed. what I firmly believe. And um, I just didn't want to forget about that because even though it sounds like, oh, I went through a hard time and then like, oh, you, everything was great. Like, no, there's, there's ups and there's ups and da- ups and downs, ebbs and flows, like that suffering when it's going to happen, it can be my, minute suffering. 
maybe medium suffering and a lot of big suffering. Like, what do you, how, where are you going to put it? And my father actually ended up going to the same rehab that I did. And he is, uh, been sober since, uh, 2019, like November. Um, and this guy was alcoholic acidosis. I mean, he had a knife and a, and a heart going through his, through his chest. What was going to go first? A knife and a gun going through his yeah. chest. Cause he had the painkillers and booze. Oh, wow. So, um, last year he got diagnosed with uh dia- um, kidney failure renal failure he had a, a kidney disease when he was 30 years old it's called burgers disease kidney and his with you know drinking doesn't help of course but his kidneys gave out he's been on dialysis since last february i attempted to be a donor but i also have um, an autoimmune disease ulcerative colitis so that was the only reason why they want to take me and it's and it you know it stinks, right? It, it, yeah. it sucks. Um, yeah. Shared it on social media a few weeks ago, blew up. But no one was, like, oh, we, you know, oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. People reached out and friends of mine. And it was like, well, you don't know because we, you know, we didn't share it. But I did share it with my my circle of reps and responders and things mm-hmm. like that. And actually today got a call early in the morning that my, my mom and my father were heading down to Hackensack, New Jersey Hospital because they... They think they have a kidney for him and uh, it's a match and he's going through the whole process right now. So again, ups and downs, right? When I found <laughs> yeah. out that I couldn't be that donor in October, it sucked, man. It really sucked. Sure. Um, and a few months later, that's why like that one day at a time, which is like the hardest thing to do, but it is also the one, this is the most peaceful thing to do is absolutely true in, in, in my world. And sometimes you have to cut it down to like 20 minutes at a time, an hour at a time. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of great takeaways from your story, and I think it's as you know, um, as much as I do, is like when you're interviewing and talking to people on podcasts and stuff like that. There's just a lot of things that you you personally learn, like you, like you say, and seeing something uh, in someone else, right? Like I I can see some my I can see some things in me in you like you know that resemble me like and i can see that and i which helps me in a lot of ways i always say like like you're saying life is full of these ups and downs but like listening to you learning from you like i can minimize those ups and downs by the things i've i've learned from you and that's the one of the biggest reasons why i do the podcast is just try to like even out those ups and downs in in our lives so that we're able to handle them better to be resilient right I, and I appreciate you being so vulnerable, Frank. Like that—that's one of probably the, or probably the top most vulnerable story I think I've had on the podcast. Oh wow! Thank you. I, I, I one going back to what you just said before. Previously, was I? I agree. Um, I agree a lot when you when basically you can accept that we're not so different. That's where the healing starts to begin. And then second, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, if was nothing really to hide. That didn't get me anywhere in my in in my life and in my career. Fake it to make it only only worked for a very short period of time. So um, no, I, I appreciate you letting me come on here and sharing the reps mission and sharing my story. And hopefully as long as it helps just one, that's why we do uh, what we do is why I do what I do. And thank you for helping me stay sober today, because this is definitely a great, great way to be right in the middle of the afternoon, hour by hour and positive impact for the rest of the day. And if anyone ever needs anything, you know, we're here to do the best we can. Yeah. And I think that's just the, you know, to kind of wrap that up is a little bit power of vulnerability, right? The power of being willing to be vulnerable, to share your story is definitely going to help someone else. Yeah, absolutely. When when we we know what our everyone has a kryptonite or an Achilles heel. Once we know what it is, that's 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 a good that's a good tactical plan. But once we accept, right, it's different. Once we accept what it is and say, okay, this is this is me, this is this is a part of me. What am I going to do now to help hopefully heal it or kind of like tame the beast? Right? What coping yeah. skills do I have? when that Achilles heel gets injured or that kryptonite, you know, hits me. And in regards, that's 
that that that's the alcohol to me. Yeah. Uh, but it has it's an everyday work, Jerry. I mean, I could say like life is all rainbows and sunshine, and I'd be li- I'd be lying to you, you know. Like yeah, every day is a beautiful day, um, but it's uh, just vulnerability and ups and downs. That's yeah. it. What are you going to do with it when start going down like up 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 on that roller coaster, and then all of a sudden, tsh- yeah, shoot out. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Frank, where can people uh, follow you and follow the the mission of Reps for Responders? Uh, RepsforResponders.org. My email is reps for our email, RepsforResponders at gmail.com. Instagram, Reps underscore four underscore responders. Uh, pretty active on on um, on Instagram. Our, our book is on Amazon, YouTube channel, uh, podcast. on. It's called Inside the Labyrinth, where we just had conversations like this me and my co-host both cops and talked to other first responders and other people not first responders or not to uh talk about how they got to where they are so i i appreciate it, jerry thank you for letting me be on here and sharing my strengths experience and hope and thank you for your service yeah thank you i really appreciate it thanks again for listening don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast if you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of our host, Jerry Dean Lund, through the Instagram handles at Jerry Fire and Fuel or at Enduring the Badge Podcast. Also, by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com, for additional methods of contact and up to date information regarding the show. Remember, The views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our hosts and the current episode's guests.